in studying this message that I had this morning, uh, I prepared for you this morning. It, it just strikes me. Um, the nature and the character of the Lord Jesus Christ and, and of, our, of the Father's heart for his people. And he loves us so much. There's so much brokenness around us and we experience it. But this morning I'd, I'd like to talk to you about the reason why Jesus performed miracles. And we're working through the gospel of Mark and we'll be continuing in that book today. And as the context for where I'm going with today's message, last week we, we talked about after the, the healing so that occurred. Um, Jesus healed a crippled man earlier in his ministry in the synagogue on the on the Sabbath day, if you remember that leading up to this. And then then last week we we read into the scriptures about how the Pharisees and the Herodians were looking critically at Jesus while he was about to heal a man with a withered hand, and how the Lord had compassion, and, and the Pharisees and the Herodians, when they saw Jesus heal the man, you know, they, they gnashed their teeth at the Son of God rather than being glad for this man whose suffering was eased on the Sabbath day. And from the outside, you would have thought that they might have paid attention to the fact that Jesus had been sent by God to teach them something new to teach them and the rest of mankind something about the character and nature of the eternal God that they were missing. But human beings are notoriously stubborn when it comes to holding on to false conclusions about how to properly live out the law of God in their lives. It's just part of the struggle of the sinful nature. And for the Pharisees, it was more important for them to hold their own opinions about man-made interpretations of the law of Moses than it was to be open and learn from the Prince of Peace who stood before them to learn the truth that would actually set them free if they would only let go of their presuppositions. Rather than being open to the teachings of the Son of God, they blasphemed the Lord who created them and decided that they should try and kill him instead. They seen Bapti the Baptist killed. They saw the Herodians, you know, were part and parcel with that, the execution of John the Baptist, and they thought maybe they could do the same with Jesus. But because Jesus knew that it was not yet his time to die as a sacrifice for the sins of humanity, he escaped this. It wasn't his time. And he withdrew, it says, to an area near the Sea of Galilee. And this is the context for our message today. The text is Mark chapter 3, verses 7 to 12. Mark 3, 7 to 12. Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the lake. And a large crowd from Galilee followed. When they heard all about what he was doing, many people came to him from Judea, Jerusalem, Idumea, and the regions across the Jordan and around Tyre and Sidon. Because of the crowd, he told his disciples to have a small boat ready for him to keep the people from crowding him. For he had healed many so that those with diseases were pushing forward to touch him. Whenever the impure spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. But he gave them strict orders not to tell others about him. So people were attracted to Jesus primarily because they had heard that he was performing miracles and healing sick people. In the early part of his ministry, they flocked to him. Even though Jesus and his disciples had retreated from the, where they had been teaching in the synagogue in the, in the town, they retreated to a more solitary place. Needy people from all over the province were 
were coming great distances to hear and to see Jesus doing his work. The crowds were so large and so persistent that Jesus actually asked for a small boat to sit in so that he wouldn't get uh, pushed and squished. And afflictions drove people to go and see him. Sick people pressed in on the Lord from all sides so that they might, might touch him. And Jesus healed many, we read here. Now, when we observe the life of Jesus as he walked the earth, we see Jesus perform miracles. All the time in his ministry on the earth, he performed these different kinds of miracles. And I believe that Jesus performed these miracles not just for a magic show. Jesus performed these miracles um, for very important reasons. And in my message today, I want to highlight and discuss these reasons. And there's three primary reasons that we're going to talk about today why, why, why I believe Jesus performed miracles. Firstly, I believe that Jesus performed miraculous signs to authenticate his identity and reveal his power. Unlike the unbelieving Pharisees, the disciples of Jesus would come to conclusion that he was God in the flesh. Now, they had to wrestle through this, but they finally came to that conclusion, and we're here today because of everything that Jesus did in paving the way for that understanding. The Pharisees thought that Jesus was deriving his power to heal people from the devil because he had healed outside the parameters of their own oral traditions and their interpretations of the law of Moses, which in fact were wrong, were askew. They were not in line with the heart of God. How dare Jesus challenge the school of the rabbis and their rules on what could be done and what couldn't be done on the Sabbath day? The audacity of this Jesus to heal a crippled man who is unable to walk and restore a man's withered hand in the synagogue on the Sabbath. The audacity of him. Can you believe that? Here's these two guys. One who couldn't walk. The other who was lame and probably couldn't make much of a living because of that. And both of them were seeking God in the synagogue. And the Son of God didn't turn them away. He met them where they were, and he, he touched them. And I believe he did this for a reason. Now, also we read in this scripture that Jesus cast out demons because he knew their destructive influence. The fact is that the devil and his angels hate humanity and they're always bent on stealing, killing, and destroying. Wherever you have the stamp of the enemy, you have death and destruction. Stealing, dis- killing, and destroying. He always gives you a candy-coated apple, but it's poison. It's filled with gravel, and it breaks your teeth when you bite into it. He's always a deceiver. He's a liar. When he speaks lies, he is speaking his native language. He is the father of all lies. And he, and he loves to hold people in captivity to lies. But Jesus, when you look at Jesus, on the other hand, it seemed that Jesus was bent on healing and restoring and encouraging people to have a soft heart filled with righteousness. And that is something a demon would never do. John 10, 37 and 38 says, after being confronted by the Pharisees about claiming to be God, Jesus said, Do not believe in me unless I do the works of my Father. But if I do them, even though you do not believe in me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. Jesus was God in the flesh. And he wanted to leave a tangible testimony for the people to understand who he was. There was, and and there still is today, a philosophy out there that would suggest that Jesus is not God in the flesh, but just a good man, a good teacher, uh, you know, someone who has some decent things to say, but but not God. Maybe he's an angel. Maybe he's 
just a good man. There's still that philosophy out there. But Jesus showed through his display of miracles that he was in fact the Lord over all creation because creation obeyed his very word. The impossible became possible when the creator speaks. He displayed his power to show people who he was. And yet, we see people turning their backs on the Lord of creation. Even with the creative power of seeing a lame man raised up and walking. Even when someone who, who couldn't close their hand or whatever was wrong with his withered hand, to see that hand stretch forth and become whole. Even when they saw that, they attributed the works of God to the devil. Do not believe me unless I do the works of my father, said Jesus, right? But if I do them, even though you don't believe in me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the father is in me and I am in the father. There's a philosophy out there that says that Jesus isn't who he says he is in the Bible and that you can just sort of skate along the Bible and treat it as just like a good guidebook for, for making your life a little better. What does the Bible say about this? The Apostle Paul warns actually people not to turn their backs on the author of creation, not to turn their backs on the fact that Jesus Christ is God. In Colossians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, we're told this. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy which depends upon human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ, all, not just part, all of the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. Jesus Christ is the living God in the flesh. And he came and he demonstrated his power. And he demonstrated his person to the world. And that's the record we have in this gospel account. But strangely enough, the human spirit is very slow to learn and quick to doubt. Sometimes I ask myself, why, why are you so slow to learn? Ah, God have mercy. We're slow to learn. By nature, we're slow to learn. And we're quick to doubt. Yeah, when everything's going well, you know, we're, yeah, we're doing, doing good. God's good. But when the bottom falls out of the bucket, what happens, right? We're quick to doubt. The disciples, even the ones closest to Jesus, they were slow learners, just like you and I are. This is human. This is human nature. You know, they didn't get it, even near the end of Jesus' ministry. Some of his disciples didn't get it. They were questioning the Lord's identity. In John 14, 6, and 11, 6 to 11, they were asking about the Father, and, and they were wondering about what the Father was like. And they didn't get the fact that when they were looking at Jesus, they were seeing, they're seeing the character of the living God. The Father was in him, and he was in the Father. The two, the two persons of the Trinity were united as one God. God. Jesus isn't a demigod. Jesus is God in the flesh. The Trinity, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, they're all one God and have the attributes of the one God, even though there's three persons. And I know this is a mind melter for a lot of people, right? It's hard for us to understand this. But... We read about this in John 14, 6 to 11, where Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes into the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. He's talking to his disciples. You do know him and you've seen him because you've seen me. And if you see how I act and what I do, you're seeing the heart of the Father. So when we look into the miracles of Jesus and we see him touching the broken humanity around him, we look and we see this is the heart of God for the people, for us. Philip says, show, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been among you for such a long time? 
Anyone who's seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least, at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. The evidence of the works themselves. The Creator touched humanity. When he came, the incarnate God, he was incarnated as a human being, and he came and he touched us. He touched the people. Sin and its effects were devastating the earth and its population, but God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever would believe in him would not perish in the penalty of sin, but would receive everlasting life. This is the powerful message of the gospel. God came to the earth, in flesh as the living son, and he performed miracles to authenticate his identity and to reveal his power. Amen. But he didn't just came, come to the earth and perform miracles for that reason. There's another reason. I believe Jesus performed miracles to reveal his heart of compassion and empathy. I believe that Jesus very distinctly saw and understood the suffering that was brought on humanity as a result of the rebellion and the fall. The penalty of sin was indeed death and the result of the decay of things in the realm that we live in is the result. It's apparent that there's brokenness everywhere we look, isn't it? Everywhere you look, there's brokenness. Both in the spiritual realm and decay and, and, and death in the physical realm as well. And the Lord understands the brokenness we have to live with because of the prevalence of sin. The question is asked so often, if God is so good and loving, couldn't he have created a world without brokenness, decay, or evil? Would that have been so hard for him to do if he's the author of creation? Whatever the particular struggle we face, the question of suffering is one of the hardest questions of all and one of the biggest barriers to faith in God. And some people may have even written God off because of the evil and the painful things they have seen and have been through. If God existed, he surely would not have permitted that evil or painful circumstance to happen. If he does exist, and if he has let that happen, then his character must be one of cruelty and sadistic, enjoying games that he plays with mortal man who is subjected to the punishment of suffering in this life. Some feel and express how they feel very openly. And I've heard this say. I've heard people say this kind of thing. Trouble suffocates me. Worry entangles me. By night I can't sleep and by day I can't rest. The burden of suffering is intolerable. Where is God? Does he know? Or are my prayers heard only by a wall? Is he near? Or somewhere distant and only watching from the outside. These are the raw realities of people's questions. I would venture to say that the most significant reason why a great number of people turn their back on God has to do with suffering, at least in North America. You see, we live in a society that hates pain, don't we? Everywhere you look, there's, everyone's trying to escape pain of the reality around them. Well, how can we escape suffering? We want instant pain relief and instant gratification. Pain is so disdained that it's hard to imagine how a good God would allow pain even to be part of our lives. People lose their faith over it, right? Often behind this sophisticated and intellectual arguments against God is a deeply hurting heart. Deeply hurting and wounded. How can there be a God with all the pain and suffering in the world? There's answers to these questions. I could preach a hundred sermons on answers to that very question. And it can surprisingly feel very complex. And some experiences of suffering that people have on an individual level or a family level or a community level are, are so intense.
We feel that the world, in our nature, we feel that the world should be different. It should be free from suffering. But I want you to consider for a moment how that very impulse is a longing that God placed within us to see everything made right. And the reason is that God wants us to look for something beyond this life. Did you hear me say that? He wants us to look for something beyond this life. And we don't get it because we're caught in the rat race around us in our 100 years or whatever. And it feels like forever, but it's not. It's a zing. It's a little dot on the line of eternity. This realm that we're in is just a little pinprick dot on a line that stretches on forever. To us, it seems like forever because we're on that dot right now. But for those of us who have lived our lives, you can hardly believe how time has flown by and now you find yourself looking in the mirror at this old person. I do that. I look at, at myself in the mirror in my profile. Where is the young athlete that used to be? What's happening to these hairs of mine? They're growing white. They're falling out. Pretty near every tooth in my head needs a, a filling. I, partly because of my love for candy. But we look at this, right? In Mere Christianity, author C.S. Lewis stated this. He said, my argument against God was that the universe seems so cruel and unjust. But how had I got this idea of just and unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. What I was comparing this, what was I comparing this universe with when I called it unjust? So when we consider perfection is like a straight line, we look at our lives in comparison and we know that we live in a world that is terribly crooked and is broken. And how do you fix a story that is broken? How do you fix a story that's broken? We all have our stories. And some of them are so broken that they seem beyond fixing. Now as a race, God gave human beings, he gave us a free will to choose between him and to choose between him and evil. He didn't give us a choice. If he didn't give us a choice, we wouldn't have the capacity to actually love him. He's so brilliant, he's so powerful, he's so awesome if we were presented with no alternative, we'd be like little wind-up robots all over the place going, yes, God, yes, God, three bags full, God. Do you love me? Yes, I do, God. Yes, I do, God. We'd be robots. God didn't have that in mind. He wanted a, a creation that would love him because love is the deepest relationship that is possible. And God wanted to allow for that so that his creation would choose freely, would see who he was and would choose to submit themselves to him and love him as their father and take him as their own. He chose this path. But with that, we see the fall. Sadly, the first man, Adam, and his wife, Eve, chose to push away from God to satisfy their own desire to be the Lord over their own destinies and control their own outcomes. And this is how evil came in to pollute our race. Adam and Eve chose themselves over God, just like people today are choosing themselves still over God. Adam and Eve, the first sinners, of the human race, which was steeped into that sin. I like how the New Living Translation explains it. Romans 5.12 says this, When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone for everyone's sin. With that sin came with it the suffocating darkness of suffering, disease, and decay, what was perfect, was broken and was subjected to death. And death is a process of decay. But God, in his love, 
did not give up on this. He saw, he foreknew this. He knew this was going to happen. And he is not some distant cosmic sadist. The Christian faith says you fix a broken story by embedding it in a much bigger story where in the end good wins and evil loses. Romans 5.8 tells us this. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And on the road to that mission, God entered into our pain by coming into this world and experiencing it while he was here. See, our Lord Jesus Christ gets our pain. He gets the suffering of this world. He's been through much worse. And he did it all so that I could experience and you could experience and those who would believe could experience his love. Jesus' incarnation as a human being, his suffering at the hand of sinners, and ultimately his death for broken people shows just how much he cares and he understands the captivity and the pain that Adam's race has been subjected to. He understands. He is compassionate. Jesus, the perfect one, despite being mocked and beaten by the very ones he created, carried the burden of sins that had not been his, and he carried them to the cross. He was pierced for our transgressions. Right? We understand the story of Easter. Or at least, if we don't understand it, this is what it's about. Jesus had all of the sins of the entire world thrown at him, even though he was perfect, and he suffered that. He bore those sins on the cross. He was the creator of the whole universe, and he humbled himself and became obedient to death on the cross like a servant. The king of kings became a servant. Why? Because of his compassion for broken and lost people like you and I. It's a torment that we can't fathom that he subjected himself to, being in his position and humbling himself to that, the position which he came. I don't think we can fathom to it. Fathom it. We can never say to God, you don't understand. God understands our suffering on a much deeper experiential level than we give him credit. Because God's great love and sacrifice for us, we have a way to be reconciled to him through Jesus. And this doesn't mean that we're no longer going to suffer in this realm, in this world. It's subject to decay, and the Bible says it very clearly. In this world you will have troubles, but do not be afraid, for I have overcome the world. What does that mean? It means that when this realm is done and when we breathe our last, for those of us who believe we get to spend eternity in the paradise of God where there will be no more suffering. Suffering draws our attention to the fact that things are broken and that we need God to intervene on our behalf. Lewis, C.S. Lewis, I'm quoting a couple of things from him in this sermon. He's one of the great thinkers of Christianity. He once commented on the problem of pain saying this, we can ignore even pleasure, but pain insists upon being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. See, if there was no pain and suffering, people would just go along their merry way and continue on the road to destruction. God uses pain to get people's attention to come to him. It doesn't answer all the questions or take the pain away, but it's comforting. I hope you're, you, you, you derive some comfort today from my words. It's comforting to know that Jesus gets me. He really does. He gets my pain. He was described in the Bible um, in Isaiah, right? 53. A man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. If we bring our suffering to him today, we don't come to a God that doesn't understand. 
who is aloof or indifferent or distant from our suffering, we come to someone who really knows and who really cares. He gets it because he's been there. So each of us have a choice in our pain. We can either run from God or we can run to him. And the God of all comfort promises that he will give us his peace even in the times of suffering and trouble. One day God promises there is going to be justice. There will be justice. All suffering will end for those who believe in the Lord. One day there's not going to be death, mourning, crying, or pain, and he's going to wipe every tear from our eyes. But this day hasn't arrived yet. And he's giving us time to get our choices right before him. He knows best, and he knows that our world of suffering is the best way to prepare us for eternity, what's to come in eternity. See, God has this eternal perspective that we don't see. We don't have this eternal perspective. All we can see, all Clint can see in his flesh is the nose and the end of his face, and that's about it. I can't see like God can see the big picture, right? This is where it comes to trusting the Lord. Trust him. He is a good father. He is a good God. Jesus demonstrated the goodness of God by touching people and healing them in his ministry on the earth. This is a reflection of the heart of God for humanity, and he will make all things new. Revelation 21, 1 to 7. says this, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And then I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and will be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. And then he said, write, down the, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all of this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. And in that scripture, you hear the echo of Lewis in his scant writings. If I find myself in a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. We were made to inherit the kingdom of God forever and ever and ever. We are made for that, my people. That's what God says to you. That's what he says to me. My people, you are made for everlasting life. Don't you see that it's just a little while? Don't you see it's just a little time of suffering and everything will be made new? Jesus showed us who he was when he healed those sick people. And when he cast those demons out, he showed us the heart of God for his eternal purpose. But Jesus didn't just perform miraculous signs to reveal his identity, power, and the heart of compassion for people. No, thirdly, Jesus performed miraculous signs in his earthly ministry to highlight his teaching. Jesus told Pilate that the reason that he had come into the world was to testify to the truth and that everyone on the side of truth would listen to him. For example, in John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32, Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. The teachings of Jesus our truth and the teachings of Jesus set us free. What is truth? Jesus says this, my word is truth. He said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. 
Jesus performed miracles. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. Not just because he wanted to flash some magic tricks to fool people into giving him personal praise. He wanted to point people to the Father God who loved them and as such wanted people to come and to listen to his teachings, to consider what he was saying, to repent of their sins, to believe and to follow him. God doesn't just want people to acknowledge that he is the son of God. He wants people to follow him. He wants you to follow him. Me, to follow him. He calls us to that. You see, the people that were seeing all these miraculous signs or hearing about these miraculous signs, they came from all over the land. The text tells us that people came from Judea, Jerusalem, Idumea, and the regions across the Jordan around Tyre and Sidon. And these miracles gave the people to the opportunity um, to see what the heart of God speaks into life. Not just experience, but everything in life. They came to see what, what God was doing and what God was saying. And some people, when they heard what Jesus said, they didn't like it because sometimes when we hear what God tells us and God speaks to us and he tells us something, in our human sin nature, we don't like it. And the tendency is to push away from that and say, I'll take this, but not that. That's just too much, right? You see, Jesus' miraculous signs set the stage for the Sermon on the Mount and the teachings that he gave and all the parables that he was given. We're going to be talking an awful lot about parables as we continue in Mark. But Jesus, the miracles gave Jesus the opportunity to speak to people about the state of their hearts before God. And our Lord Jesus definitely understood this truth as well, that not all of his teaching was sweet music to the ears of those who listened to him and heard what he was saying. It wasn't sweet music to some of them. Simply put, there are those that neither have interest nor regard for the things of God. That's why the Lord spoke in parables. When we look at the parables, to those with a genuine hunger for God, who are seeking him genuinely, the parable is both an effective and a memorial vehicle so that we can remember what Jesus was trying to get at. I mean, when we think about the parables, right, you remember the stories. Right? Think about the Good Samaritan, for instance, that parable. That sticks in people's minds. And then we can, we can, we can get something what God is trying to say through that. There's a conveyance of divine truth in parables. And, you know, his parables are rich in imagery and they're not easily forgotten. So it is a blessing when we who have willing ears open our ears and hear what the Spirit of the Lord says through these parables. But there are those that will see and hear and still reject the word of the Lord. See, those miracles were done for the benefit of those who would believe. Because those who would believe would open them, their hearts up to his teaching. And when they opened his hearts up for the teaching, they would have faith in him. And they would follow him and become his disciples. And then they would experience the life that he offered. That was his purpose in all of this. And the miracles opened the door for people to see that Jesus um, was teaching something to them that they needed to, to heed, that they needed to follow. You see, sometimes we start, stop short in the, in the North American church asking people to give their lives to Jesus and, and, and say the sinner's prayer. We stop short. That's important. It's a, it's a first step. The point of it all is to go and make disciples. 
We need to be disciples, followers of Jesus, not only hearers and believers that he is God, right? The demons believe in God. The demons believe in Jesus. The, the Bible says that they even tremble at the fact they have such faith that Jesus is the son of God, they're freaked out. But their belief is not accompanied by repentance and following the Lord Jesus. And that's where God has called us to be followers, to be disciples of Jesus Christ, to learn from him, and also to make disciples as we go, which includes evangelism and telling the story of the gospel, and it also includes teaching to train them up and so that people might be built up into the maturity of faith, of a disciple, of a follower of Christ. That's the goal. Ah. The Apostle John tells us that the miracles of Jesus were help to help understand this. He said, John says in 20, John 20, 30 and 31, he says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So this morning as you go home, Think about these things. The miracles of Jesus were, were, were given to us and recorded for us in the Gospels. First of all, to authenticate God's, Jesus' identity as God in the flesh. Second of all, to reveal his power and control over all of the outcomes. To reveal his heart of compassion for those who suffer and who are lost and to highlight his teaching that the truth is written and has been shown to us and demonstrated to us that there is eternal life in store for everyone who believes and follows him. Amen. Would you bow with me in prayer?